For those of us just joining us, uh, we apologize. We had a little bit of technical difficulty in the Zoom, the Zoomiverse. So um, <laughs> on now, um, we'll give it a couple more minutes to see if anybody else shows up. Nice to see Mary Jo out there. Hi, Mary Jo. Uh, for now, I'm going to leave participants just muted. And then at the end, um, I will allow folks to turn their mics on and ask questions freely. Um, just for the sake of keeping it a clean recording, um, we'll keep participants' mics off for now. Sounds good. All right, this is still loading up, so but we'll be no making a talk no to worries. get the first few slides. <laughs> no worries. Um, yeah, we can get going here. So um, thanks, everybody, for joining us. If you don't know me, my name is Noah Delinajek. I'm the executive director of the Nicanicum Watershed Council. If you're not familiar with the, what, what a watershed council is, we're a nonprofit in the state of Oregon that's designed for, to do um, a lot of riparian restoration, but also some other habitat restoration work in really weird sort of what seems to be geopolitical kind of boundaries, but um, they like to say it's drainage basin, basins, um, and we, we really focus on Seaside and Gearheart and the surrounding uh, mountains of that area. So... Um, I'm glad to have everybody here today. Um, if you're interested in learning more about our organization, I will put our website address in the chat box. And um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker today, Mr. Anthony Melithopoulos. Um, and he is a professor at or Oregon State University and focused on the Oregon Bee Project. And he's gonna take us through an awesome journey today, learning a lot about the bees that are particular to the Oregon coast. Um, so if you're ready, take it away. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for having me today. And I'm hoping everybody is safe and had a, um, um, got their power back on. Clearly, if you're here today, but you may be doing this through your phone still. But it was quite a, a quite the weather that we had. Um, I'm just, I we had some technical difficulties on this end. So I'm going to just talk for a little bit about my program um, and then hopefully um, my presentation shows up. So I'm Associate Professor of Pollinator Health. And what I want to talk to you today is about some of the remarkable bees that we have um, uh, in the state of Oregon, but particularly on the coast. The way I was going to start off with, I'll just run you through my slides. I can't see them yet. They're still loading up from the cloud. Is you all know, I hope that we have a new Oregon license plate. It is just come out. It was, uh, it's a really remarkable plate. And the thing that's really neat about it is it has on the front two bees. Now, one of those bees is a wild bee and we're gonna be spending most of our time today talking about wild bees. But the other one is a managed bee. And I just wanna start with a nickel tour of the managed bee. If you can uh, picture the license plate, we have a crimson clover field and there's a honeybee colony in it and honeybees uh, do a lot of crop pollination across the state. Currently, right now, our beekeepers, our commercial beekeepers, we have about 85,000 colonies, are heading down to California. They got caught in that bad weather, but they're loading their trucks up and those bees leave the state um, uh, as you can see behind me, look, you can see uh, Mount Hood in the background. They leave the state to pollinate almonds, but they come back in the state. And you've know, heard these stories of these beekeepers and their colonies that are just roaming everywhere across the United States. That's not the case in Oregon. Our bees leave for February and March, and then they come back into the state and they pollinate a number of crops. Now, the other thing I was going to point out to you, in addition to honeybees, and one of them is, of course, cherry on the coast as you go down to the south coast, and also up in Long Beach, there's also coastal cranberries, uh, but we have Hermiston melons, uh, must, much of the seed production in the United States, vegetable seed, but also legume seed is produced in Oregon. Um, so those honeybees are really busy. And I'm also just going to take a moment here just to force quit this and try this again. It does not seem to be starting. The other thing I did want to point out, can anybody type in the chat? I don't know if you, they have, the, they have, no, I hope they have the opportunity to do that. Can anybody type in the chat um, 
what other managed bees we have in Oregon? Let's see if that's even a possibility for you. I can't see the chat. Oh, ah, there it goes. All right. All right. Well, hold that thought, folks. I can't see your chats. Oh, there we go. Alf, Alf. Thanks, Mary Jo. Mary Jo knows. Mary Jo is one of our star volunteers. Uh, one of the few people in the program I'm about to describe that's on the uh, working in the North Coast. Yes, Alf, Alpha leaf cutting bees. And with that, for some reason, my slideshow has magically appeared. So let's let's look at the pictures. And there's another chat in there. Okay, yes, of course. Let me just do that here. Uh, and I just got a message from... We're going to be underway here, folks. Oh, and here we go. Admit, 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 admit. All these people to admit. And... Noah, ask to unmute. All right, Noah, are you back? Yes, thank you. Okay, fantastic. Okay, great. I'm also going to make you see if this screws anything up. But I'm going to make you a co-host. Okay. No, I can only make you a host here. Okay. Okay, no worries. All right, thanks so much. Sorry for uh, the delay. So here's what we're going to do today, folks. I want to tell you about the remarkable uh, bees of the Oregon coast, but I also want to tell you about people like Mary Jo, the people who love them and are working with them in your area. And so this is what I want to do. I want, as I started off, tell you about the unwild bees. I also want to tell you about the bees that, which are the managed bees that I just was talking about. I want to tell you where the wild bees are. I want to tell you about the master melatologist program. And I want to tell you about ways that you can pitch in. So let's get started. As I said, the unwild bees. Here's the Oregon license plate. If you haven't got one yet, get one. And on this, you can see a honeybee in a clover seed field. And as I mentioned before, in our nickel tour of the unwild bees, our honeybees are busy across the state pollinating a number of crops. They're very important for agricultural production. Here's a typical honeybee colony. You probably have seen this on TV. Thousands of nestmates, a single queen working together. This is very unusual when we look at the other bees of the state. As I mentioned, they'll come back from California. Here we are in uh, the Dalles doing ch uh, sweet cherry pollination. Here we are in a, a beautiful crimson clover field. This seed is going to be used in restoration projects uh, across or across the United States. It's a great cover crop uh, for fixing nitrogen, but also for weed suppression. The bees will pop over uh, the Cascades. Uh, about uh, 10,000 of the colonies go into carrot seed pollination um, in um, uh, primarily around Madras. Then we have these other bees. The uh, Mary Jo mentioned one of them and the alfalfa leaf cutting bee, but there's also the alkali bee. These bees pollinate that purple plant on the uh, east side of the Cascades, alfalfa, alfalfa seed, which is used primarily in hay mixes. That one bee, the alkali bee, is a native bee. And it's the only bee in the planet that people have figured out how to encourage them to nest in large aggregations adjacent to a crop. So we have the alfalfa field in the back and these bees will nest side by side by side. Let's look at it again. You'll see one single female. What the, the growers do, this bee likes on the east side, those alkali beds that sort of where the water comes away and then the alkali flat is there. So they put hundreds of pounds of rock salt and as you'll see, they run irrigation pipes underneath just to get that perfect texture that these bees love for nesting in. This is an unmanaged bee. Uh, this is a managed bee. I also want to talk a little bit about this bee, the bumblebee, which is a wild bee, but also very important in crop production. You can see it here visiting a red clover blossom. And in fact, when you go into the Willamette Valley or into um, over in... Um, Lagrand, where they also grow red clover seed, these bumblebees 
are very high densities. It's late in the season and they're critical for pollinating this crop. So this, you can see it's different from that crimson clover. And you can see all the pollen on her back legs that she's collected from the florets of this clover blossom. I haven't talked about mason bees, but mason bees are another uh, managed bee, but also a wild bee. I wanna transition now and just talk about these wild bees. I wanna also point out, we now have a brand new field guide called uh, the Common Bees of Western North America. It's the first thing I've ever seen that's comprehensive enough, but has all the bees in the West. It's kind of a field guide, like a bird guide for bees. I will tell you for some of these bees, you really can't tell them flying through the uh, landscape, but it'll give you a good sense of these different bees, including this one that you find on the coast. We used to think long time ago when I first started here that we had 500 species of bees and there's certainly a lot of them. There are big bumblebees that you're gonna be seeing on the coast in a, in a month from now, the big queens emerging from their hibernation. There are bees that are small little specks, like the one you see in the bottom right corner, bee in the genus Pertida, in the mining bee family. We have bees that are green. We have bees that are red. They don't, that blood red bee looks like a wasp, but it's a bee. They are all unified in that they are they are kind of wasp-like. They're an offshoot of the wasps, but they've developed the special habitat, habit of a very close association with flowers that I'm going to talk about in a minute. Now, one way you can figure out how many bees we have is this project, which I'm going to be talking about uh, um, on and off through, um, through the talk, iNaturalist. If you don't know iNaturalist, it's a smartphone app developed by the National Science Foundation. And you can take a picture of a bee at a flower and it will uh, use machine learning and kind of help you figure out what bee it is. And if you use that, just visually looking at the bees this way, you come up with 169 species. So out of 20,000 people who've submitted observations, you can see 2,000 of those observations of those 20,000 are the honeybee. And you can see the little pink sign in the corner saying it's an introduced species. It does come from Europe. Um, but you can go through here and you can see that they become rarer and rarer until you get to the bottom where there may be only one observation. But that, that only gets you to maybe by eye, visually, 169 species. And we have at least 500. I'm gonna leave you the actual count till the very end. Now, these bees have a, a different size. They look different. They have different behaviors. Some of these bees are not very good pollinators. They steal the pollen and they don't contribute much back. But what I really want to get at today, I want to kind of focus in on, because I know for many of you, I imagine you have property and you want a garden or you're interested in restoration because you're a part of the Watershed Council. You're interested in the plants and I will tell you, there is not one bee plant to rule them all. There are a variety of plants, and knowing those plants and the association with these bees is the key part to doing restoration. Let's back up a sec. So bees, what am I talking about with flowers? What do bees need? Well, the first part of this equation is bees need, this is a small little sweat bee. She's in a nook of rose, and she's telling you what she needs is she needs a place to make a nest. And from that nest, after she commits and build that nest, you saw those ground nesting bees before. After she builds that nest and is committed to that spot, she needs to be, get adequate forage, which in, this, in most cases is nectar and pollen from this flower for the span of her life. We have some bees, maybe 20% of them, maybe less, maybe it's about more like 10% of them, that form colonies. Most of them, 90% of them are solitary. The 10% of them that form colonies it has to be over the span of the, they need plants continuously over the span of the colony life. Now, one of the things that, if we just go to the floral, like the different plants, you'll notice that different bees have different plant needs. And one of the one of the ways to distinguish this is tongue length. 
Some bees can get in flowers like this golden currant with an exceptionally long trumpet shaped, uh, we call this the corolla. It's a very long flower part. The nectar is at the base of the flower. There's lots of bees in this landscape, but she's the only one with a tongue long enough to get at the bottom of this golden currant. So she has all of this nectar, the sweet fluid at the base of the flower to herself. There are all sorts of uh, plants that have these long corollas. You can see them. Some of them are obvious. If you look at a veg flower up close, it has a very long uh, corolla. Some of them are not that obvious. And Syncia is a, a native plant that you find um, in disturbed areas. And you see that it looks like a small little flower, but if you trace it down, it's actually quite long and narrow to get into it. And maybe an extreme example of this is our larkspurs. Uh, larkspurs, you can kind of see it, um, that long, pointy, sharp thing at the top. The nectar is all the way at the back. So to get at that nectar, you have to have an exceptionally long tongue to get into it. That's one of the ways that bees, why you can't have one plant, is bees partition themselves by tongue length in getting the nectar. And so uh, having a variety of different flower shapes can sometimes bring different bees. Here's an example of a very, um, a somewhat long-tongued bee. Our, these are our spring uh, uh, longhorn bees in the genus Eucera. You'll often see these on manzanitas, um, but also on things like the Amsinchia um, uh, and other, uh, on a larkspur as well. But I want to tell you that the real big differences that happen, the real kind of way in which bees partition themselves is through pollen. I have poppy in front of me to remind you that not all flowers have nectar and pollen. Poppies, including our native ones, but also the cultivated ones, which bees love, they all are just pollen producing plants. There is no source of nectar in them. Same goes for lupins, and um, I am from OSU, go beeves, and you can see that bright orange beaver colored pollen. Lupins also are a pollen only plant. You can see this bumblebee just uh, going to town collecting pollen off them. This whole idea of pollen and bees that have specific pollen needs is a key concept when thinking about restoration. So, some bees, particularly social bees, have evolved the capacity to digest pollen from a wide array of plants. Think of this, folk. You're a bumblebee. You start in the spring, your nest, and maybe you're visiting willows. But by the summer, there's no more willows, so you have to shift on to something else. So those bees have evolved the capacity to digest their larvae that eat the pollen that makes the new bees, have evolved the capacity to digest from a wide array of pollen. We call those bees polylectic. But there are bees in our state that have narrow, uh, specific pollen preferences. There are bees that will only go to one family of plants to collect pollen. We call those oligolectic. And we have some extreme specialists that you will only find collecting pollen at a single genus of plant, and we call those monolactic. Let me show you some examples of these. Oh, I will point out, I am a big supporter of Oregon flora. I think it's a one, if you don't know Oregon flora, you should visit their website. It is a, it is a state treasure. And if you haven't seen their uh, volume, uh, they have these, uh, uh, these, printed volumes of the distribution of plants across the state. Volume two in, append in its appendix has a list of a number of um, uh, plant specialists. And one of them is actually appears, you're gonna see in a second, it's the second one. You see Duforia calicorti, Mariposa lily. We'll see that in a second. Now I wanna point out, this is really important. This is hard to get across because Many of you know uh, there's uh, shrubs like our California lilacs, which you can get cultivated ones in native varieties, are oozing with bees. They have a lot of bees on them, and they're wild bees. But I want to let you know that even if a plant is full of wild bees, 
it may not be the weird ones, the specialized ones. To get those, you have to know a little bit about botany, and you have to know a little bit about what the plant, the bees like. If you want to find the wild things, you have to go a little bit further afield. So here's an example um, of an oligolectic bee. This is a bee that you will see, folks, in the genus Melisodes. It is our sunflower bees. And if you've ever seen a bee on a sunflower uh, that has these big brushy back legs, those are the females. The males have very long antenna. You see that on sunflower, That's those are one of the bees in the genus Melisodes, and they only go to composites. So this is rabbit brush on the eastern part of the state, probably one of the most important bee plants in our state. And you can see it's also a composite, so you find this bee closely associated with it. For more extreme specialists, here we have a bee in the uh, genus Calliopsis, and only you will only find it with Rocky Mountain bee plant on the eastern part of the state. Finally, here's the bee that we saw in the second line of the Oregon flora, Duphoria calicordi. I think Mary Jo has collected one of these. Uh, you only find it on subalpine calicordus lilies. And that brings me to the second part of my talk. Here we have volunteers at Mount Hood, third week of June. The calicordus lilies are up and these bees are everywhere. I want to tell you a little bit about these people because they combine a number of things that make uh, that had allowed Oregon to do something that no other state has been able to do. What we've done is we found curious people like these and Mary Jo, who's joining us today. I think we have somebody else on here too. Who else is from? The, and Pam Hayes is here as well. We have curious people. We've connected them with plants, the plants that the bees are going to and the wild bee, a kind of uh, infrastructure for uh, um, identifying wild bees. And we've created the Oregon Bee Atlas, which is unique to Oregon. Well, it it's it's starting to spread, but in Oregon, it started. It's really a wonderful thing. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to telling you about it. I did want to pause and just check the chat and see if there are any questions. Um, I can check the chat and oh yes, I I am no I am I am checking for um, people who are trying to get in. Okay, I will be looking at the chat. So if you have any questions, please just type them in. I think you can. Yes. Okay, on we go. I am now really excited to tell you about this program, the Master Melatologist. This is the only maybe complicated thing that I have for you to look at today. Look at this atlas of um, the United States. This is from a few years ago. And it was, a, it was a census of all the substantive bee surveys that had taken place since the 19th century. Now you'll note there's different colors. The depth of the color, the kind of deepness, the darker it gets, is the, the number of species that were detected. And you'll know, you'll see that there are actually dots in the eastern United States, but they're pale. Most of the species diversity is in the west. And when you look at this, you'll, you'll note that there should be, you know, something in Oregon, Idaho, Nevada, but it's been poorly surveyed. One of those dots in Southern Illinois comes from this gentleman. He was a pioneer, Charles Robertson. He was the son of a druggist. Uh, I guess that in the late 19th century afforded uh, a, a good income. So what he did is he spent his days uh, in the East Temperate Forests down in, uh, the, uh, down in the south of Illinois, making a ledger like this. So you can see on this ledger, there's a bee and then corresponding to it, there's a flower species. That's what he did. It was very simple. And when we were thinking about the kind of uh, way to construct a program in Oregon, we were very inspired by this effort. It seems simple, and it 
yielded more information than just where a bee was and what time of year it was found, but it told us something about the plants that it was going to. We looked for a model and I, I hope there's some master gardeners uh, in this uh, um, uh, in this talk, but um, master gardeners were the model for us. When we thought, could we have a master gardener program for people who study bees, which uh, is a melatologist? So could we have a master melatologist program? And it was really interesting because immediately when I suggested this, people came out of the woodwork and they were remarkable. So Pete and Gretchen Peterson uh, from Bend, Oregon, sent me a long email describing they had collected bees before and they were very excited and could they join the program and here's their modest collection. And I was so impressed. I just knew uh, immediately that there's talented people in this state doing amazing work. And if we could just create uh, uh, um, a platform for them, they would do wonders. Um, here you can see a number, uh, uh, here are some folks from, uh, uh, again, from Central Oregon, just kind of key to, uh, who rose to the call and became the ranks of the master melatologists. And so this program started modestly in 2018. And what we've done is we have a program where we volunteers come in and what we do is we have a, uh, an intensive training program for volunteers to um, uh, to learn the basics of, we wanted to give them a lot of freedom, but we needed to give them, we really wanted to ensure all data that they collected was done in a way that would be important to science. So that's led um, uh, by uh, Jen uh, Larson and Sarah Taylor. And we have a number of, uh, it, a lot of the training is online. We have six modules where you go through, you learn how to catch a bee, uh, if you know you're, uh, you have to you have to actually prepare specimens in a in a museum quality. And so what we have is a a module where you do it, and then we watch we you upload screenshots, and we can say, oh, you're pinning too low, or pin a little bit higher. So we have that all uh, a whole uh, online training, allowing people from who aren't in Corvallis to be able to participate. We figured out how to kind of make a base kit. Um, so we can we now know how to get this in an envelope and send it anywhere. And we had this real simple, we knew a lot of people who wanted to join the program were, um, you know, like Martha Richards here and Pam Arian, who's going to come to the screen. They have jobs and they don't want to do a lot of paperwork. They want to go out and walk through the flowers. So we came up with a real easy way for them to do what uh, Charles Robertson did, you know, uh, 150 years later, what they do is they take a picture of this vetch on their phone and then they uh, take three pictures. So we have a, a, a picture document of the flower and it gets identified by botanists. And then they associate all the bees they collect on this vetch with our project. Then what happens is they go home and we have a computer program that takes all those images and turns it into these teeny tiny labels that every, when we started the program, people were terrified about these entomological labels. But we figured out a way using a computer program to generate all these labels and then it goes in the mail. So every, you know, every Mary Joe and Pam, every once in a while, they'll check their mail and out will come this little envelope with all these little labels and they'll put them on their bees. We also have these trainings uh, as well. In addition to the um, the the training that you do in the uh, uh, online, one field day, one lab session, and we also have an optional taxonomy course where people learn how to identify their bees. And it's been really great. The one thing I love about this is I whenever I did this activity, I would do it on my own, but it was wonderful to see people come together and go on collection trips together and explore Oregon. We have some wonderful um, spots in Oregon with some wonderful flowers where, where bees are. And it's really allowed people to uh, make new friendships, uh, but also learn a lot. This is kind of like a endless learning tunnel that you can go down.
Yeah, you may notice some of our volunteers sometimes at a picnic table with a couple beers, um, some snacks, and, you know, um, uh, preserving all the specimens that they got in the day. Now, those specimens all come to Oregon State University. And so once they get to us, uh, we have a, a job to do um, because we need to put names on all those bees. And also, if they are rare bees, um, make sure that they find their way into a museum collection. So you can see how we started in 2018. You can see the map starting to populate over time. And it's been really amazing, the coverage that these volunteers, you know, just imagine each one of these spots is somebody getting out of their vehicle, collecting some bees on a different plant species and keeping track of the plants. And there is no, I will tell you, no other place on earth with this level of contemporary bee plant coverage. It is amazing. They are remarkable people. I will point out, uh, we've also started to expand. Washington has, a, uh, is we're training volunteers now. The Washington legislature has created a Washington Bee Atlas. In British Columbia, they don't have any support, but they're doing it anyway. And there's also an effort in Idaho. So this effort is starting to spread. And one thing that's happened recently is that this is going to be now moving to New Mexico. So this whole program that started here in Oregon has really become the basis for um, bee monitoring uh, across the nation. So we started off with this black hole and we've solved it. We have an answer to the question of the bees of the state and we're increasingly getting to know uh, where these bees are. Clatsop County is, I think Mary Jo has been doing yeoman work in Clatsop County. It is not an area that we've had a lot of coverage for. If you look, there's only been 135 uh, spots that have been sampled in Clatsop. There's a lot of the uh, there's a lot of the county that remains unsampled. So I think there's a lot of opportunity in the county to uh, find some new records for the state uh, up there, especially being so close to Washington. Oops. So those bees come to us and then we have a taxonomist at Oregon State University. And the license plate has been really wonderful because uh, the license plate will, part of the license plate proceeds will support this position uh, going forward. It's a real critical position and Oregon's one of the few states to have a person who knows the bees. So the, bee, the boxes come in from the volunteers. Uh, each one of these boxes has about 200 bees in them, and they all have been labeled and meticulously put together by the volunteers. And we've been able to build a reference collection at Oregon State University now uh, using classical uh, microscopic techniques, but also an extensive DNA barcoding uh, where we look at the DNA of bees that can't really be determined by classical methods. And we have this reference collection that's not only allowing us to... Uh, us and other researchers to study these bees because we couldn't put a name on them before. But also it's contributing to or, uh, to Washington and Idaho's efforts because we have a reference collection now that can help with them with their efforts. Our volunteers, after we go through a cycle, will get a report. It's a number of pages long that gives them a list of the bees that they've collected and where, where those bees were found. And I want to just highlight some of the amazing things that they found. These are uh, two bees that um, were only known to science from 60, 50 years ago. Were only known from one or two specimens, like one or two occurrences in history. Hoplitis marginata was a bee that Judy Maxwell, who's a master gardener uh, down in Josephine County, found uh, foraging on uh, um, stone crop or native stone crop sedum at high elevation. As soon as she made that association with the sedum uh, uh, and the stone crop, uh, the, with the sedum, volunteers started finding it all the way up to the base of Mount Jefferson. So a bee that was obscure to history has now become, we have a very defined range for it. Atoposmia oregana is a similar one, really only known from a couple specimens in Mackenzie Pass and Crater Lake. And uh, a retired accountant 
uh, Ellen Waters, really wonderful person, uh, knew about this record, had heard about it, went back up to Mackenzie Pass and not only rediscovered it, but also made the association with this Penstemon. Amazing work. This one always gets me. This one was found just, you know, a, a mile from my office. We've had entomologists at Oregon State University for a hundred years, and they never noticed that there was this bee, which is likely, an, it, it may be a new species, but it's definitely a first state record um, that was a tarweed specialist. It has been probably been there for millennia and uh, just discovered. Our volunteers get these little badges that they uh, there's uh, mark their milestones of discovery. Um, I just have one. I have a couple more bees, and I want to tell you about some bees on the coast that are really cool. The this one here is a cuckoo bee. It's a bee that doesn't. Its sole job is to find other bee nests and lay its egg in there. Um, it has this beautiful look at that blue band on its uh, on its abdomen. It hadn't been seen north of Yolo County, and then our volunteers discovered it um, uh, up in the Columbia Gorge, way beyond its known range. And here are the volunteers that discover it. And the one I wanted to just highlight quickly is the one in the middle, Merrick Stanton. Now, Merrick was somebody who I had, uh, we, when we started doing a lot of this programming during, uh, during the pandemic, he would come on with his camera off and he would type these very elusive, uh, very lucid, smart questions about bee biology. And I was convinced that Merrick was a 70-year-old German man who was a former entomologist who retired in Oregon. I had a whole persona in my mind. And then he sent me a graphic novel, and I realized he was he was 13. And um, it's a great graphic novel, by the way. Uh, we've been trying to get it published. But he is a remarkable, he, he kind of got into the program. His mother has to come to all events because we don't, you know, we don't take, we don't have the capacity and the training for, to have minors in the program. But he is also the person you may have known, you heard, is the person who designed our license plate. So uh, remarkable people. So there's three Bs that are my te the taxonomist Lincoln Best told me to tell you about. So you've got, um, you've got these three Bs. The one is a sweat bee, but it's a beautiful sweat bee. Um, sweat bees nest in the ground. Um, uh, it's the Pacific sweat bee. And it's look at this beautiful um, metallic colored uh, small bee um, that you have on the coast. And you'll find it, um, um, yeah, you'll, you'll find it in areas where there's some dunes. Gorgeous little thing. Okay. We also have a wool carter bee. There are wool carter bees that everybody has. It's a there's a European wool carter bee that's if you have um, lamb's ear, it's the bee that hovers around and headbutts all the rest of the bees. But we have a a wool carter bee uh, that nests in dunes, and um, it is such a gorgeous bee. Just look at this thing. Fuzzy has those. Uh, this whole group has these. Um, colored uh like they look a little bit waspish on the back they've got these little yellow colors uh these little yellow uh stripes in their integument um on their abdomen just look isn't that a gorgeous looking bee the thing about uh these bees as well is that they have very uh um uh thick hairs so that they can tunnel into the sand so they've got um it, it they have to make the nest in the sand so they have to be able to like have little shovels so they have shovels built into their legs which i find remarkable now there you can see their little shovels <laughs> and then this is a bee that is uniquely if you were to have a, if, if you decided to have a mascot for your county this bumblebee really has a narrow distribution along the coast it's called the fog belt bee bumblebee for a reason it looks really similar to a common bee that we have th that's on the license plate. So the bee on the license plate is the yellow-headed bumblebee. It looks identical, and I'm sure um, uh, the, the volunteers here can talk about the struggle of identifying it. The only difference is it has some yellow hairs uh, underneath 
uh, its abdomen and that's sort of one of the diagnostic features. So it's, uh, but it's uniquely a coast bumblebee. Okay, so these bees, all that information comes back to us. It goes into our museum, Oregon State Arthropod Collection, and then the data is uploaded to the world uh, through a uh, the Global Biodiversity Information uh, Facility. So that data is available to scientists, for, you know, to do what uh, climate change studies, uh, looking at range distribution shifts. They can do whatever. So we provide that data outwards, and one data. Uh, one piece of data that we have got, which I want, really want to focus on because I think it has um, big implications for restoration, can be depicted here. This is the same thing we saw in that ledger. Charles Robertson had that ledger. Remember, there's a bee and a plant. Well, obviously, you might find, let's say, this: the colors represent different species. Red species, you might find red species of bee on pink species of flower, right? But you may have another record that it goes to the blue species as well and the green species. So you have all of these kind of interactions that go on. Of course, you may have some bees and type it in the chat, if you will, that only goes this navy blue bee only goes to the yellow species of plant. What kind of bee plant interaction is that? Okay. And give you a chance to respond if you're if you're thinking in your head monolectic you're right okay now you imagine this but with all of the records that the volunteers have collected and this is what it looks like so here you can see this is um, uh, we did this at our last conference in march last year and you can see on the top we've got all the bees and on the bottom the plants and each connection is the connection between them and just look at what the volunteers have created. It's just remarkable. Each one of those dark bands is a, a plant, uh, is a bee on the top and then on the bottom plant. It's just this remarkable web of the interactions of bees and plants in the state. And I will tell you, no place else has this. There are some interesting things when you start to dive into this uh, um, uh, data. This is from the Steens Mountain. Uh, this is all our records from the Steens Mountain. And you'll notice what they've done here. The bees are on the bottom, the plants are on the top. Things pop out. And the color of those lines is our families of bees. So uh, um, the apidae, which the bumblebees are in, are in blue, and you'll notice that a lot of these in the steens, a lot of the apidae are bumblebees, and notice that they are conspicuously dependent on one genus of plant, even though bumblebees are generally uh, considered uh, uh, polylectic. In the steens mountain range, cercium, the thistles, are disproportionately important. This kind of data starts to pop out, and for people doing restoration work, this becomes an essential piece of information. So I just went, just without looking at these interactions, I, we're still working on a tool to sort of uh, render them down uh, at, at the level of a watershed. Uh, you can sort of like get better lists. If I just look, grossly look at the plants where bees have been collected in Clatsop, you can see a number of them are you know, introduced in invasive you know, plants, including, including bull thistle. I filtered this out to take all the introduced plants out, and this is what that looks like. So of the uh, of the plants, the number of obs, and the, uh, there's not a lot of observation in Clatsop County. So, you know, we've got two observation on common cell field. There's clearly a lot more bees, uh, you know, it's clearly a lot more, um, it'll probably rise in importance the more we sample. But I did want to sort of give you a sense of some of the what I think the important plants in the county might be. The first one, and overlooked almost all the time, so easy to grow, so easy to propagate in any wet area, are the willows. Willows have a number of bees that specialize on them. Willows are extremely important 
for bumblebee queens that are emerging, they use the pollen. And if any of you are mason, I think I saw some something in the comments around mason bees. When people have looked at the provisions of mason bees, everybody thinks, oh, it's maple. Oh, it's Oregon grape. Willow pollen is often at extremely high proportions. Willows, these male willow plants are, I'm sorry, these female willow plants are key. The thistles are important. Oh, I hate to tell you this, but we do have, in addition to the invasive thistles, there are thistles on the coast that um, uh, Brevis, Brevistylum is the one. I have never seen it in the wild, but uh, I know we the ones that we have, uh, I, we have a dual on, in the Willamette Valley. They do grow. They're often misidentified as invasive ones. Thistles are really, really important across the state. I can't overstate how important they are. Anything in the bean family, in uh, uh, the legume family, and I'm just, you know, we have a number of legumes on the in Clatsop County. Uh, so this is uh, filtered for Clatsop County. Uh, some native uh, vetches, uh, lupins. Um, we have native trefoils. Those are all super, there are going to be some very interesting bees visiting them. Finally, I always say the composites always have interesting bees. And so if I was to break the composites up into three groups that you will find on the coast, we have our American asters, uh, the symphotrachum, uh, the goldenrods. There are a number of goldenrods that you will find. But also on the coast, you do have interesting tarweeds and there are coastal gumweeds. So all of those are going to bring in some very interesting bees. I'm going to stop for questions in a sec, but I did want to let you know that I think that we've been working, uh, trying to work more and more with conservation organizations. And I know the temptation for those who are new to things and any conservation organization will probably point you towards this adage, but anybody who's new wants to plow it up and start a meadow. The more sensible thing to do is take stock of what you have on your property, take out the invasive weeds, protect what you already have growing on a property and add what you can. And we've been trying to, uh, Think about how to do this. We have a new program. Uh, it's kind of just rolling out. Uh, this year is still a little bit of a trial year, the Bee Steward program, where we have some online trainings and field days. But ultimately, what we want to do is have something like this, where a person could go on their property and take pictures of plants on their property and make an inventory. We can take that plant inventory, input it, and run it against our bee plant records and say, Hey, you probably have about 65 species of bee. And here are the most important plants that you have. And if you added just these plants, you could probably boost your species number up to 70. So that program is going to try and merge these things together and give you those tools. We've been doing this uh, already with uh, wine producers in the Willamette Valley where they've been creating projects for their property. We upload it. We run it against the bee records and we kind of give them, when they're doing conservation, uh, we give them a little bit more targeted, you know, spend your money on this plant, not, 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 not this. Okay, I see questions have, have piled up. Let's maybe take a, a minute to answer some of them. Okay. Okay, Carol writes, I have had mason bees, but concerned they may compete with my local uh, North Oregon coast bees. I live on a sandy, uh, on sandy soil, so must provide clay for mason bees. Uh, don't think they would live here on their own. I, I'm i sure Lignaria, uh, the Osmia Lignaria is on the coast. It may not, um, it may not be uh, pro as prolific as it is in other parts of the state, but I'm sure it's out there. What I might suggest, Carol, is when you are getting mason bees, uh, try, I'm a little bit concerned because in the Willamette Valley, there is an invasive mason bee. My bigger concern is that you think you're getting the native mason bee, but you end up with these, they're kind of a brown bee with a horn on them. Um, they, the cocoons look very similar. You might bring some of those over to the coast. So 
I think Mason bees are fine, but try to keep your uh, purchases uh, from producers that are on the coast. So if, if you can do that from the master gardeners or something, I think that would be okay. Uh, Carol, okay. Uh, native pollinator restoration people here pull up the native wild blackberries, which my Mason bees are using and planted asters, which only bloom late in fall. So did I try any mason bees last year. I'm concerned many of the local uh, bees also no longer have the blackberry blossom and I have no berries. These berries bloom much earlier uh, uh, than Himalayan blackberries. They also planted lupins. Yeah, the, I think this is kind of uh, some, I, I will say that, you know, for, uh, for mason bees, you know, those willows are really, really important. And I would, uh, but Uh, I do think there's a lot of blackberry ambient in the landscape. Uh, and, you know, the thing with blackberry control is if you don't control the blackberry, you'll have a blackberry monoculture. For some of the, that may be good for mason bees and honeybees, but for a whole lot of other biodiversity, it can really choke it out. And it is, you know, so I, I understand your pain, but at the same time, um, it, yeah, um, It's, it's, you have to do it in restoration work. Okay. And Noah, uh, I wonder if there've been any work in timberlands similar to that of vineyards. Yeah. So we have been working, we have been working with Hamptons a little bit. So Hamptons, the owner saw a Ted talk or something on pollinators and has had employees work on, uh, And they've, they're really innovative. I think timber companies across um, the region have been looking to Hamptons for leadership on this because they have been working with ways, whenever they do a burn pile, um, they they were the first to discover that seeding into those burn piles as soon as they cool, they could create some pretty amazing native plant communities uh, with very little weed pressure. They've been doing that on a, a, a pretty extensive scale. And I've noticed other companies are starting to pick it up. And so I've been interested in those experiments and I really, you know, I think um, support any effort to kind of um, uh, get some, because, you know, once that is open, um, you have, you know, especially the way trees go on the coast, you have eight years or so before it closes in. And if that's done more extensively, I think it could help with um, all sorts of biodiversity. Great questions, folks. Well, I'm almost at my end here. So let me just, I think, A lot of you want to know how to pitch in. And I will say, you know, join this program. But you may say, this looks too intense for me. I have limited time. I, I want to contribute, but I don't want to do all that. I will say, it's really, it, gardening is great. But um, oftentimes, your local conservation organizations um, have figured out important places where a, 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 a plant community can be reestablished. Those kind of extant plant communities that were here before are, are shrinking. And any efforts that can be done to create a sizable chunk of the plant community that was there previously will, is worth its weight in gold. So do uh, support your local organizations that are doing this kind of conservation work. I, I, we do have volunteers and there's a number of, well, we have two of them on this call. Um, uh, so Pam and Mary Jo uh, will have done uh, tabling events like this and just getting out and talking to people about bees. And we do have a program that you can get free material and cards, the Bee Advocate program. You take a little bit of a training, but then uh, we provide all of these cards. Uh, we don't have one for the coast. We have West of the Cascades. Uh, but we have these cards, we have seed packs, uh, and we have these coloring books as well. So uh, to distribute to the public. I will also say uh, master gardeners are really important. Master gardeners have a lot of pollinator uh, programming, uh, native plant programming, getting uh, engaged with master gardeners or going into some of their training you can pick up a lot of uh, ideas on how to do things. Finally, I have one Uh, off quirky one. It's the great uh, uh, Oregon uh, squash bee hunt. We have this bee that turned up. Uh, it was uh, 
somehow it just never it's all over all over the US. It's a native bee, but it never kind of made its way into Oregon. And I'm not sure why, but uh we started to notice it in southern Oregon and it's been moving. Uh Miranda uh Jones was working in my lab and we We have an ongoing survey where you can take pictures of this bee, and you can see what we've got here is a map of the the deepness of the color is how much zucchini, squash, or pumpkin has grown. And you can see it's been moving up the coast. And we just don't have all, I have no records in Clatsop. I'm really curious if this critter is there. So if you're growing squash, or zucchini in your backyard, it's real easy. You just go in with your phone and take a picture and show us if it's there. And if it's there, uh, you might be the first one in the county to find it. It's inevitably going up and it is a great pollinator of zucchini and squash, exceptional. So it's coming your way. The question is when. You can buy bee plate. Bee plates are available at DMV and uh, I, uh, I, most all of it go there's a little chunk that goes to dmv but the rest of it comes uh to be research and for us that taxonomous position will not be possible without uh without the revenues from the plate so um if you if you if you're going up for registration get one of these beautiful bee plates okay but i did promise i would end so i said 500 species and what do we have well the last time somebody came up with a number it was in this publication from 1969 they said the Pacific Northwest includes Alaska. It goes this whole chunk and parts of Idaho and, uh, you know, even into Montana, big region. And they said, if you go through it and they, they, you can see they have a column here for the Northwest and the column for all of America and North America. And they go by uh, B genus. And, oh, and you go to the bottom, they said 879 species for that whole huge reason, region, okay, including Oregon. Well, the volunteers, we know they've, uh, we've collected from all six families that we're expecting to be here, 55 genera. We have names on the, of the bees that collected, 400 names on, uh, on those bees. 125 of them, we have name, DNA type names. And then in 150 of them, we're sure are, are just distinct just by coloration and pattern. So we don't quite have a name on them, but we know we have over 600 in just what we have. And when we look at neighboring states and what's in the records and what the volunteers still have to discover. Oh, uh, sorry, I kind of tripped myself up. So 600, and this is what that looks like. These are the bees that the volunteers have, sorry, it's gonna be a blur on your screen have discovered since 2018 in the state of Oregon. Just remarkable work. It goes all the way to Z. A very crazy looking bee, by the way, funny antenna. So if we go through this list again and think about the bees that we likely have, but still haven't discovered, um, go down this list. The answer is 42, no. It's not 42, it's 782. We think we have 782 species of bees in the state. We have about 600 identified. Uh, we have a, a little bit more to go, uh, but it's been a remarkable, uh, it's been a remarkable ride, I have to say, working with these wonderful people. So I hope I've given you a sense of the unwild bees, uh, where the wild bees are in our state, this master melatologist program that's sort of cracking open our knowledge of bees and giving you some ideas on how you can pitch in. And uh, if you want to know more about the program, it's on the extension website. You just type in master melatologist, you'll find it there. And I also just want to uh, shout out the people who've supported this. We've had a number of federal grants. Beekeeping associations have supported uh, uh, us. We've had um uh bottle drop foundation um and as well we've had what's been most notable to me is we've had a number of private individuals who contributed um uh, the one that sort of is closest to my heart is the uh, jerry and judith paul native pollinator fund uh, these were uh, uh folks in um corvallis uh in the conservation they were 
passionate conservationist. Jerry passed last year, but he, um, uh, while he was alive, he set up this fund uh, to help support all this work at OSU. And I, it is with no, um, it is with no, uh, uh, it is with perfect timing that we are ending this uh, slideshow on a thistle. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Open for questions, and I have to. Noah left me some messages here, so. I think Noah, I'm going to make you. I'm going to make you the host again, right? Okay, here we go. Good. Oh, make host. Hey. Okay. Oh, I can still talk. Good. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks, Anthony. I appreciate it. Uh, wow, fantastic talk. I learned a ton, so I appreciate it. Um. I have a question, actually, if, if others don't, um, and I'll just throw it out there for now. I wonder if you've seen, um, oh, whoops, turn my camera on for you. Um, I wonder if you've seen a change in <clears throat> like the availability of funding for restoration orgs that's more focused on pollinator habitat. It's kind of a needle in the haystack sometimes to find funding that's not like so fish focused, you know, and of course, as a watershed council, traditionally, that's where we were at. But there's kind of, a, sh I think, a shift that a lot of people are talking more about needing to put a higher priority on pollinator habitat, not not just the in-stream stuff. And so I wonder if you have any kind of insider knowledge on on where some of that funding, if it exists, is. Uh, well, no, yes. So a couple things. There was supposed to be a, a splash of money coming through um, on on the infrastructure bill for roads, and I've been trying to talk to ODOT about where you know where it's coming from, and I'm not sure. I think it just kind of like vaporized. Um, of course, Senator Merkley uh, is a big supporter of pollinators, and so you know federal funds for this kind of work may materialize. But I think it's going to because of something else. We have um, some bumblebee species that are. We have one. We have one threatened and endangered bumble. It's in well. It hasn't been seen for a long time in southern Oregon, but we're likely going to see some more in the state. And I think that's going to drive some conservation dollars um, for those restoration uh, for, for restoration. Okay. And of course, uh, you know, butterfly conservation does, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service does have um, some priorities around uh, butterfly conservation on the coast. Yeah, I know. And there's been kind of a growing interest in looking at some of the Clatsa Plains habitat for the silver spot and trying to, you know, kind of build a consortium of organizations up here that that might try and tackle some of that habitat work. Um, but there, have, just, there just doesn't seem to be like the same infrastructure available to talk about pollinator habitat, like there is, you know, fish habitat. And so I just wondered if there's any rumblings underneath of like, will, is there going to be kind of a push? Because it seems just as important to me as a, as a restoration professional, honestly. And so I just, I wonder about that sometimes. I, the other, the other thing I was going to say is if you're a private landowner, of course, NRCS, but NRCS in the state of Oregon, Natural Resource Conservation Service, sets its priorities at a watershed basis. So you have to go to those meetings, uh, you know, when they're setting the priorities and it, stakeholders need to sort of, you know, stakeholder driven in the state of Oregon. So they need to be able to express. And of course, there's lots of, you know, big problems that NRCS has to sort of work with, uh, 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 primarily water quality. But um, there are... You know, uh, in the mid-Columbia region, it is a priority, and they spend money towards uh, restoration uh, dollars. So, yeah. But yeah, I was at I was recently at Greenbelt Land Trust. Uh, I, the, I have a podcast. The last podcast was there, uh, and they, you know, um, they were talking about they were they were eligible for equip grants, so they had a number of uh, equip um based uh projects that they'd put in okay cool uh anybody else have any final questions before we let Anthony go and get some dinner okay well i appreciate uh everybody showing up and um Anthony, i really appreciate your time and expertise 
And um, I will send out the recording to everybody who is on the registration list for this event in the next couple of days. It'll also be uploaded to our website. Um, and I think that's it. Great. Well, nice to see all of you. And also great to see Mary Jo and Pam, uh, uh, two of our really wonderful volunteers who are uh, really at the forefront of, of doing this work. Okay. Thanks, everybody.